break the protein into smaller, more manageable pieces using a protease. All right? You with me there? I think you should know where trypsin cuts. You should know where does trypsin cut. Okay? Lysine and arginine. Uh huh. Okay. Here's chymotrypsin. Now, chymotrypsin is a little bit more complicated than where it cuts, and I'm actually not going to make you memorize that. There's about five or six. And chymotrypsin can cut next to many things with different varying efficiencies. So it's kind of complicated. But I mentioned chymotrypsin because it's related to trypsin, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later on. So I just want to expose you to it just so that you're aware it's a protease also. Okay. And it also cuts fairly specifically. You can see here it's cutting at tyrosine, then tryptophan, then phenylalanine. And you notice those are all three aromatic. They've got big rings on them. But it turns out chymotrypsin will cut other places. So we're not going to worry about the specificity about where chymotrypsin uh, cuts. Yeah. Adjacent to it, right next to it. I'm not sure I understand. No, no. So right next to right next to either either one of them. So next to an arginine, it'll cut it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It it cuts actually on the carboxyl side, for what it's worth. Yeah. I you don't need to know that. I'm just telling you as long as you know it's adjacent to it, I think that's all that matters for our purpose. Okay. All right, now there's another reagent that we use in the laboratory to break proteins into smaller pieces that's not an enzyme. These guys are enzymes. They're breaking peptide bonds. The other guy that we use is called cyanogen bromide. And cyanogen bromide is very easy because cyanogen bromide, it doesn't break peptide bonds, actually. It, it actually causes a chemical reaction to occur that breaks the protein where methionine is. So it breaks the protein where methionine is. Wherever there's methionine, it's going to cause a break. It's a chemical. It's not an enzyme. Okay, And so it's another useful tool for specifically taking a protein and breaking it into smaller, more manageable pieces. We'll talk about these later in the term, and I want you to just be aware of them. You should know where uh, cyanogen bromide cuts. Yes, next to methionines. Yes? Well, uh, yes and no. Because every, what you find is when you look at a whole bunch of different cells, the different cells make different proteins. So that's why you do it the way I described, which is you take, let's say, a normal one that's not cancerous or that hasn't been treated, and you compare it to one that has. Because if I were to compare, let's say, uh, a uh, uh, profile of, let's say, skin cells to a cancerous liver cell, I would see a lot of differences simply because I would see differences between skin and liver anyway. And I know what you're asking is not that. You're asking, do I have a master thing that tells me where every protein is on there? And the answer to that is no, I don't. So. That's why I have to compare things as much alike as I can. OK? OK, good. We're moving along. And we're not going to talk about that. So that finishes what I want to say there. OK. Uh, let's see. We're turning our attention to enzymes. Enzymes are workhorses of the cell. They catalyze the reaction. Okay? They make things happen in the cell. And so it's important that we understand how enzymes work. Now, I'll be honest, I think there's something almost magical about enzymes, and I'll, I'll try to convince you of that as I get going through and talking about some of these things. There's almost something magical about enzymes. Some of the things they do, they're hard to fathom. Okay, I'll give you a real good example, just to get a little ahead of myself. A real good example. We'll talk about one enzyme. It's, called, it's um, uh, an enzyme that is called carbonic anhydrase. Don't even worry about that for the moment. But what it does blows my mind. All right? Carbonic anhydrase catalyzes a reaction okay, where one enzyme 
will convert one million molecules, that is, it'll catalyze a reaction on one million molecules per second. One enzyme. Okay? Now, one million per second is pretty hard to imagine. How do a million things come in and leave in that one second? It's, it's something that our minds have a hard time grasping. Okay? But they do it. And what it tells us is that things that are happening at the nanoscopic level, nanoscopic meaning very, very, very tiny, are different than things that we can relate to in the real world. I have a hard time in the real world, okay, imagining General Motors making a million of something in a second. General Motors being a factory that does and has a tremendous number of employees doing a million things in a second is hard to imagine. The macroscopic world doesn't work that way. It doesn't work the way that the nanoscopic world does. At the nanoscopic level, I can have that happen. And I compare it to General Motors because enzymes, in a lot of ways, are like factories. Okay? So there is something magical about enzymes. So it's important that we understand something about enzymes. Free energy. Oh, boy. Something else for us to calculate. Let me tell you, we're not going to do any free energy calculations on this exam. Okay, so you can relax about that. I'm going to describe free energy to you in very simple terms. So no free energy calculations on this exam. All right. Free energy, what is it? It's the amount of energy that's available to do useful things. It's a simple way of putting it. The energy that's available to do useful things. If we look at a, an enzymatic reaction, and we were to sort of sketch out what happens in an enzymatic reaction. You guys probably saw this in general chemistry. You discover that there is a, an energy of the starting materials, and there's an energy of the products. And the difference between those is the amount of energy that is given up in the reaction. Well, in order to give up that energy to go from here down to here, I have to invest some energy. Okay before I fall back down this. You guys have all seen this type of graph before, I'm guessing, right? OK. So this transition energy, or energy of activation, which people call it sometimes, is a barrier to the reaction. The analogy I like to give is, imagine that I'm standing here in Corvallis, and I've got this giant stainless steel ball. OK. And as a class, we decide that this giant stainless steel ball would be really cool if we rolled it into the ocean. OK? Now, in theory, we should be able to take this stainless steel ball, go out here into the, the street, and push it to the west, and it should go into the Pacific Ocean, because Corvallis is a couple hundred feet above sea level. Well, you say, what are you, stupid Ahern? Right? Okay. Of course, that doesn't happen. Why? Because we have activation energies we have to get over before we can get to the Pacific Ocean. So you say, ah, well, I've got it figured out then. What I will do is I will take my stainless steel ball, and it's a class project. We will take it to Mary's Peak, which is the highest peak. And we know that we get up there and we push it off as long as there's no trees in the way. A lot of clear cutting, you never know. Okay? As long as there's no trees in the way, once we get into that highest peak, we know even if it's going to go up and down and up and down, it's going to make it all the way to the ocean. And it will, as long as there's no trees in the way. You with me? There's Mary's Peak. The highest peak that's going to make us there. Well, the smarter ones of you say, what the hell are you doing that for? You don't have to go all the way to Mary's Peak to make this happen. Plus, I don't really feel like pushing it all the way. Let's just go as high, only as high as we need to. Let's go to the pass. That's really the only thing we have to worry about is getting over the pass. That's what the enzyme is doing. The enzyme is finding the pass the enzyme is finding the pass such that it has a lower activation energy than does the non-enzymatic reaction. And by reducing that activation energy, the enzyme is favoring the reaction significantly. So I want you to underline, I'm going to tell you this again, an enzyme lowers the activation or transition energy. You can call them the same things. It lowers it. Something that an enzyme does not do is it does not change the energy of the reactant or the product. Those two energies are the same. 
So the energy of the reactant does not change, the energy of the product does not change, and so the overall energy of the reaction does not change. Because the overall energy of the reaction is this minus this. Okay? Make sense? So only for that transition is that change. But by lowering that transition energy or lowering that activation energy, by doing so, a lot more molecules can react. And that's what an enzyme is doing, and that's why an enzyme works so fast. Okay? There are enzymes who speed up a reaction, okay, over 50 quadrillion times compared to a non-enzymatic reaction. Okay? 50 quadrillion times. Now quadrillion is a thousand trillion. Okay? 50,000 trillion times. A good chemical catalyst is probably good at doing a thousand fold. An enzyme in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases is doing 50 quadrillion times faster. That is pretty phenomenal. Why do, they, why do we have to have them work so fast? The analogy I like to give is imagine that you're out in the woods and a grizzly bear decides to chase you. Do you want to get out there fast? Do you want energy fast? Do you want to be able to react fast? Absolutely. Okay? Living systems have to be able to respond to things very fast. If they don't, they're eaten. They're dead. Okay? It's a real good example. We don't want to wait for that reaction to get going and in a couple of trillion years, a couple of million years, we're able to get away. Okay? We were long ago dead. Okay, so that's what's happening in an enzyme. Questions about this before I move on? You guys could explain this to me? Yes, sir. Yeah. So this is a it's, a, it's a good question. All of these are energy terms. When we talk about free energy, okay, available free energy, it's only the difference between these two. So these are intermediates of energy if you want to think about it that way. Okay? But the overall free energy does not change. It's from here to here. And we'll talk more about energy and Gibbs free energy later in the term. We'll do a few calculations on that, and they're very simple calculations. But we're not going to do that on this exam. Okay. Let's see. So, um, what do I want to say here? Here's a simple uh, uh, comparison of no catalyst. We have a reaction rate of one. We take platinum, which is a pretty good catalyst for this uh, particular reaction that we're talking about here. It increases it by about 27,000 fold. Here's catalase, and it increases it by about uh, 650 million. Okay? That's even low compared to some enzymes. Low compared to some enzymes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Where was I at? Look at this guy. Temperature effects. Temperature affects enzymes. And it affects enzymes in an interesting way. For reactions, we can see temperature effects where increasing temperature can affect or improve the reaction, but after a point, we see diminishing returns. Why do we see diminishing returns? We start denaturing the protein, right? Okay. So up to the point we start denaturing the protein, we can actually see temperature having, uh, in many cases, not all cases, but in many cases, a positive effect. So we have to think about when we work about en with enzymes the likelihood that we are going to uh, cause uh, problems with that. Okay? All right. So um, at this point, what I want to do is talk about, um, describe a way of understanding how enzymes do, and then we will have a song. How's that? Okay? All right. So I want to describe two ways of thinking about how enzymes work. One, you were probably taught in basic biology, and it's wrong. And one that I'm going to tell you that is better, okay? Instructors always say their way is better, right? All right, so the way you were probably taught in basic biology was that enzymes work like a lock and key. Have you heard this? Have you heard how enzymes work like a lock and key? The key fits into the enzyme and unlocks it and makes it work, right? 